I never miss an opportunity to go to Central Europe. Um, actually, I learned Europe. This is just a touch. I learned Europe in Warsaw with Bronislaw Geremek uh, a long time ago now. Um, and uh, I, I keep having this uh, perspective on Europe uh, that is neither uh, based in Brussels or in Paris, especially, but uh, from the Central U uh, European countries. And um, and I would like to start like this. Um, uh, the, the sorry, the president of Lithuania, uh, Ingrida Simonite, said very very aptly that, that we are now in a defining moment. And um, she could not be she could not be more right about that. We are in a defining moment, as we have been in the previous crisis. It's fully it's it's quite true that um, that the money quote is very um, apt to describe the, the way Europe builds itself. We have been in crisis all the time. The problem is that this crisis is slightly different from the previous ones. Um, when the, the tragic of history is knocking again on your door and you have completely lost sight of what it means to actually deal with history, which is basically what happened to Europe. I mean, I know that if you remember this infamous book by, by Robert Kagan about Mars and Venus and European and, U and the US, it was extremely um, uh, dishonest in the presentation at that time. And yet it was nailing, a, it, was, it was nailing it when it comes to the fact that Europe has always, or Europeans, I shouldn't say Europe because the member states have a different take on this. Europeans have always have a kind of, uh, relief to be out of history, out of the dirty business of history uh, um, um, and, uh, for, for the past 70 years. It doesn't mean that the European member states have all relinquished on what it means to be dealing th with this. But Britain is one of them that really uh, uh, came to the conclusions that it should, uh, it should go its own way to get there. And France is always also struggling with the fact that it's no longer a great power, but it would like to be taken as one. And it's still hovering with, uh, with what the European Union could be or could not be in this regard. So the, the, the tragic of history is in the chilling statement of Vladimir Putin when he says basically he's warning everyone of unseen consequences. Well, I don't know if, if there is anyone here uh, uh, old enough to have seen the consequences of World War II, but I think this is a very good address to all of us. We haven't seen those consequences at any time so far. And if that is, if that is the threat that is behind, of course, there's also a language of power that is Vladimir Putin uses very well. Um, if that is the threat, then this is an unknown threat. This is a threat that none of the European Union member states has ever met so far, which is the, the real threat of what? Nuclear war? Conventional confrontation? We don't know exactly what he meant, but that's exactly the chilling effect of it. Um, the problem is, is in the first, and I, I've got three points and I'll go quite quickly with them, but the first one is exactly that. Um, today, with the conditions that we have, Europe's response to, to Putin's challenge is impossible. Uh, it's impossible that, um, uh, it's impossible first because um, the own geopolitics of the European Union are not allowing it. We have also balances and imbalances within the European Union that are uh, so far, that have been so far very difficult to overcome. Um, uh, Germany is one of them, well, France and Britain, that's another one. Um, but the thing is, um, um, Europe is not so united. Of course, things can change. I mean, we've seen today the um, um, a very interesting um, um, uh, realignment of, of Hungarian diplomacy on European interest. So I'm not saying that uh, this lack of unity is something that dooms Europe, but it still is something that so far was very difficult. It's not the first time that Europe is disunited when it comes to taking geopolitical decisions outside because of its internal geopolitics. The, the, the explosion of, of Yugoslavia was one of the defining moments when the European Union dis discovered that. The second thing is it's, um, its economic model makes the European Union extremely dependent on its outside connections. Um, well, basically what we've seen over the past 20 years is the extension of a mercantilist approach to the world. Basically, uh, we export, we import, 
and that makes Europe's power. The normative power has been uh, always used, but only mostly, mostly so far um, to advance commercial interests. And the conversation in Brussels has always been extremely uneasy to reconnect. I'm, I'm one of those, I mean, in my group, in my political family, but also in the, in the work that I've been trying to do, we've been trying always to repoliticize that idea of trade. And, and with some extent, not thanks to us, but thanks to Donald Trump, basically, it's been kind of successful over the past five years, but it's way too late. Um, and this is the a bill that we're footing right now. Um, and the, fa the last one, and this is something that is extremely difficult to speculate on, we have societies that are averse to the risk and the cost that any kind of, of strong reac reaction would mean so far. Just in my country, where the presidential election is looming in less than 60 days, we have but five candidates or four candidates that are extremely benevolent when it comes to Russia's influence or when it comes to alignment uh, with the US interest or alignment with the European Union um, uh, proposal. So just that, uh, and they represent altogether not a majority, but a, a, a strong minority of the, of the public opinion. In Germany, it's also something that you will find in the different, expressed in a different way. In all our countries, you will find in the societies people who are aware of the challenges and will actually uh, gather at the Russian embassies that we can see in some capitals, and people who would say that basically this is not something that we should meddle in, and 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 the very definition of a European interest remains extremely um, fuzzy, if I may say. So the real question is. Um, have we learned lessons over the past 20 years? It's been 20 years that let's basically since, well, more than that actually it's 30 years, but um, there was some kind of complacency in the, in the 90s. But since the return of, of a more violent and strategic uncertainty uh, over, the past, uh, over the past two decades, has Europe been able to really go forward uh, and embrace the strategic uncertainty? Yes and no. Yes, it has tried. Some papers were produced, but if you read them, you realize that they don't really say much. I mean, the strategic uh, um, um, uh, papers from, Pro, from Prodi on, on, uh, onwards until now have always been trying to fumble with the very difficult things uh, that, uh, that Europe is struggling with, which is uh, the inability to think collectively. And this is what I, wanted, I want to... And, and when, I make, when I mean think, this is, I, I really insist on the thinking. This is what's, what's missing most of the time. Uh, Michel Rocard, the former prime minister of France used to say that in a crisis, the most urgent thing is to take time to think. And, and right now we have never really taken time to think. And when the crisis is upon us, it's very difficult to actually find the tools to, uh, to respond to it. So the defining moment is learning the language of power again. It takes three major um, reflection. The first one is on the institution. Who's driving the car or the plane or whatever? Who's driving? Um, for now, the, the parliament, the European parliament has completely relinquished any, any influence on the, on, the, on the project. Just to it, remind you that you have two more minutes. Yeah, that's exactly what I need to finish. That's perfect. Um, the European parliament is only gathering next week. They could have gathered. I mean, I know it's a green week, um, it's the holidays, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm pretty sure that Vladimir Putin chose this moment because he was very fearing the European Parliament. But let's be frank, the European Parliament could be a driver, uh, a political driver in the European Union uh, institutions. It's not. And he decided not to remain outside of the game by convening next week. So who will be driving? The big states. And the big states, that's France, and Germany that is finally dawning on the fact that they might have been a little bit too complacent when it comes to separating the energy and the geopolitics uh, issues. The second one is the strategy, where to drive. And there we, we lack something that is extremely important and that neither Russia nor the US, nor any other actors play, uh, misses, which is a, culture, a, a, common cultural, uh, a common strategic culture, sorry. We do not have exactly the same perception of threats 
whether we sit in Warsaw or the Baltic states or in Spain, Portugal, let alone in Paris and Berlin. And that is one of the biggest issues we have so far. And we have not tried to streamline this, um, this uh, cultural, this uh, strategic culture. And the last one is why and how to drive. Basically, what's the purpose? Basically, since 1892, when the first phase of the European Union has been achieved, we have kind of been a little bit too functionalist. Let's build the Euro, let's build the common tools and we'll see what kind of common Europe we will have. And we have never really embraced or at least courageously embraced the necessity to think and to give a, a raison d'être to the European project. Why do we want to live together? What does it mean? Is it just size and the globalization or are there any other uh, issues that we need to tackle and that we that that really justify the fact that we want to live together and this is the moment when of course it will be very difficult in the heat but this is the moment when we can have at least a very a, a slight beginning of those answers to those uh, of, sorry of answer to those questions and especially when it comes to power what kind of power the european union wants to be first of all and second of all, does it want to be a power at all? Because those questions are still un unanswered. And that is probably why we won't see a European response other than a European support for a big member state's response. 